Yeah, that always works. Welcome. Welcome to today's City Club Forum. My name is Ralph Delarada, and I have the great privilege of serving as president of the City Club of Cleveland this year. For almost a century, we have been coming to you from the heart of downtown Cleveland, Ohio. During this time, the City Club has served as one of the nation's premier public podiums for civic dialogue, covering the most pressing topics of our time. Today is actually my first day as president of the City Club, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, and it couldn't come on a better day as, as it is my honor to introduce our distinguished guest, Governor Ted Strickland. I'd also like to take this occasion to recognize one of Cleveland's own, Lieutenant Governor Lee Fisher. <laughs> Lee, would you mind standing for a moment? It's great to have you with us here today, Lee, and also I understand your wife Peggy and your son Jason are here, so it's great to have them here, and I'm glad we could meet with them earlier. Jason is here as well. Let me tell you a little bit about Governor Strickland. Ted Strickland was elected as the 68th Governor of Ohio and assumed office on January 8, 2007. Governor Strickland has been lauded by Democrats and Republicans alike for his forthright manner, his forward thinking, and his nonpartisan approach in guiding our state. Governor Strickland has served his home state of Ohio well and in many, many ways. He has served as a minister, a psychologist, a professor, and a member of Congress. The son of a steelworker, Ted was born on August 4th, 1941 in Lucasville, Ohio, one of nine children. He spent his formative years active in both his school and his church, and those experiences led him to Asbury College in, where he received a BA in history. He later attended the Asbury Theological Seminary and received a Master of Divinity. Later on, Ted received a doctoral degree in counseling psychology from the University of Kentucky. His passion for education has also been a theme of his political endeavors. Understanding its importance to the people of Ohio and the future prosperity of the state, he won the legislature's support for new funding for early care and learning primary and secondary education in Ohio's public colleges and universities. Ted has already secured funding for 250 new elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. On the higher education level, the governor, along with the legislature, have frozen tuition for two years at all of Ohio's public colleges and universities. And I am sure that Barbara Snyder, Michael Schwartz, Jerry Sue Thornton and Andy Roth, who are all here with us today, appreciate that effort that our governor is making to improve the quality and availability of higher education in Ohio. You know, this is just, just one example of, of, of the focus and results orientation that Ted has brought with him to Columbus during his short but already very productive tenure as governor. It, it's, it's my distinct personal pleasure to introduce Governor Ted Strickland. I've had the opportunity to work with him and his administration as uh, chair of the Ohio Venture Capital Authority and also work closely with Lieutenant Governor Lee Fisher. And I've gotten a first-hand glimpse of the fine work that this administration is doing to improve the business climate of our state. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm City Club welcome to our governor, the Honorable Ted Strickland. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I am so happy to return to the City Club and to be here with my good friend and great partner in our mutual endeavor to provide leadership to the state of Ohio uh, your own uh, Lieutenant Governor, Director of the Department of Development, Lee Fisher. Lee, thank you for all that you do to help me. <laughs> you know, sometimes people ask me what I like to do in my spare time. 
And I'll tell you one of the things I like to do, I like to read newspapers. And lately I've been reading some interesting descriptions of Ohio's economy. A Philadelphia Inquirer reporter thinks we're battered, depressed, with a deepening sense of despair. The Wall Street Journal has already written Ohio's obituary. Two weeks ago they ran a column with the headline, The Self-Inflicted Economic Death of Ohio. A newspaper in England, The Observer, sent a writer all the way from London. Listen to what he said after he had spent some time in northern Ohio. Fierce Arctic winds blow across the Great Lakes <laughs> from Canada and make for hard living most of the year. Only the prospect of full employment, a home, good schools and everything else the American dream promises make life tolerable in this harsh country. <laughs> but now the fires of industry are cold and this vast region of the Midwest faces a long and bleak economic winter. Now, before I pass out some tissues so that we can all have a good cry, let me say something to those who have a distorted view of the great state of Ohio and of the great city of Cleveland. You're wrong. Ohio has too many strengths, too many successes, too much talent, too noble a history to reach such erroneous conclusions based on superficial observations. And I'll tell you, we are building on our strengths in Ohio. Brick by brick, we're bolstering our infrastructure and supporting development in our local communities. Student by student, we are assembling a skilled workforce with limitless potential. Company by company, we're building on a foundation of traditional industries and emerging cutting-edge technologies. Through targeted investments, we are renewing and advancing Ohio. Now look, I'm not saying we don't have real challenges. We do. There's no question we face serious structural economic challenges in Ohio today. And frankly, Everything that we're trying to accomplish must be done in the midst of a national economy that has hit Ohioans squarely in the pocketbook. Last year, the nation endured the sharpest rise in inflation in 17 years. Across the country, foreclosures were up 75% in 2007, above the already high levels of the year before. You take a walk down the average street anywhere in America today, and by the time you've gone halfway down the block, odds are, uh, odds are that you've passed multiple houses with past due mortgages. When 2007 began, a barrel of oil was $50. Before the year was out, it was 100 Today it is, well, more than $140 a barrel. The struggle to make ends meet intensifies for every one of us. Wages are losing the race against inflation. Real wages have declined for American workers every month since October. Of course, the burden falls hardest on those who have lost jobs. And this national economic downturn has spared few families. 